All right, good morning. Good morning, High Point. So good to be here this morning. I will tell you this morning, I really miss my pastor being here. I uh, just got texted just a few minutes ago from Pastor Mike. He said, praying for you this morning. That means so much to me. Uh, I know he's out vacating, resting, but uh, he cared enough this morning. He loves this church and his vision for this church. And, and I love my pastor. and I do miss him being here this morning. Uh, that song, isn't that what we want? Favor for generations to come on our family? Yeah. If you would take your Bibles this morning and turn to Proverbs chapter 22. This is our very last sermon in the Summer of Wisdom series. I have enjoyed this. I've enjoyed going through this. So much wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And, uh, but here we are coming to the end, the very last message. And uh, summer is coming to an end. I hate to break that to you. <laughs> School starts just very shortly. I hate to break that to you, teens and kids. It's happening very quickly. Uh, but while you're turning there, I uh, wanted to say this uh, up front that I know many of you have asked us about live streaming. That is coming very, very quickly. We are working behind the scenes, getting everything put in place. And I will say this, when we get it turned back on, we're going to be way ahead of where we've ever been. So I think you're going to love the product of what we put out online. And uh, so... Uh, we're just going to be way a step ahead, even even for a small church plant. We're going to be way ahead of, of, of that. So excited about that. That's coming just a few weeks away. So bear with us. And then we're going to be live right there on Facebook like everybody else is. And so, uh, so if you're away, you can join in and uh, be with us in church there. And so, but I just want to let you know that's coming. Well, this morning, we're going to start with the top 10 things that parents said that you promised you'd never say again. But I can promise you, you've said them. The to number 10 was, wipe that smile off your face, or I'm gonna wipe it off for you. How many of you heard that one? I heard that one a lot. <laughs> number nine, there are starving people in Africa who would gladly eat your dinner. Yeah. <laughs> number eight, one day, God willing, you'll have one just like you. Yeah. <laughs> Paying for your race, right? Yeah. Paying for it. Number seven, I heard this one quite a bit. I brought you into this world, and I'd just soon take you out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, number six, this hurts me what? More than it hurts you. We've all heard that one, right? Yeah. And you know, I never understood. I thought, there is no way this hurts you, Dad, more than this hurts me or Mom. There's no way. But I can honestly say now that I've got kids, I can understand that one even more. It, it does, I hate when I have to discipline my kids and it, it, it does hurt. So number uh, five, stop crying before I give you something to cry about. Yeah, Ed heard that one a lot, didn't you? <laughs> I saw that look on your face. <laughs> number four, close the door. Were you born in a barn? <laughs> Now, who was actually, who's actually been born in a barn, right? Really? I mean, I thought about that. Who's born in a barn? Number three, you'll live. Yeah. <laughs> Number two, money doesn't grow on trees, you know. <laughs> and the all-time number one answer was this, because I said so. Yeah. There was nowhere to go with that one, was there? Mom said, because I said so. That was it. End of discussion. So going through these, I got me thinking, what is it that we really should be saying to our kids? You know, we say this stuff, but what is it we really should be saying to our kids? This morning, we're going to widen the scope of things. And what are the things that we want or we need to pass on to this next generation? Not just parents in this room, but this is for everybody this morning. But all of us as High Point Church... What are the things that we need to say? What are the things that, that we need to pull together on as a church to deposit into this next generation? You know, the, the old, old statement was, it takes a village to raise a child. That is so true. It takes the village of High Point Church to raise our children. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, you're part of the village. Yeah, every one of us are. We're part of that village to raise the kids. There's kids back... There's kids in this, in this building this morning that need us as a church. I'll tell you, first and foremost, we're parents. My kids need you as a church. We do. 
And, and so we're, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, the year was 1896, and an old man was lost out in the Mojave Desert. And he was thirsty. He was trying to find something to drink. And he looked off in the distance, and he saw a shack. And he raced over to that shack, frantically hoping that there was some kind of water there in that shack that he could drink, because he, he was very thirsty. And he walked in. Instead of seeing water, he saw this pump, water pump. But man, it was rusty. He's like, there's no way. So he, he was very disappointed. He fell, to, fell back in disappointment. But then he happened to see over in the corner, there was this jug. And he's going, oh, please let that be full of water. So he raced over to the jug, and sure enough, he picked it up, and he could hear sloshing inside, and he was hoping that it was water. And so, uh, but then he, he shook the dust off, and on the outside of, of that, uh, there was a note. And it said, it said, be sure, uh, be sure to use all of this water to prime the pump. Don't use any less than what's in this jug to prime this pump. And so he was like, oh my goodness, what is this? So there was directions there how you needed to prime the pump, and he was, but in his mind he's going, but I've got water. Yes, it's hot and it's stale, but I have water here in my hand. Is that pump going to work? So he took the directions and he went over to the pump and he poured the water in and he followed the directions and he started pumping and pumping and pumping and nothing happened. And he's going, oh, now, now, look here, I've wasted all my water and now the pump's not working. So in discouragement, he turned around and then he heard a drip, 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 and he turned around to see that the pump was dripping water. So he raced back over and he pumped some more on this, on this pump and then out come this nasty, rusty looking water. And so he pumped a little more frantically because he knew it was there and all of a sudden, this really fresh, clean water come flowing out of this pump. So he drank all that he could possibly drink. He took some and poured over his head so he could cool down. And then he went and because on the bottom of this jug, it said, be sure and fill this jug back up for the next thirsty traveler. So he filled that jug back up, but he said, I'm not going to leave it with that. I want to write something else on this jug. And he said, P.S., trust me, this really works. And I was thinking about that story this morning, church, and there's a powerful message in that little story. Church, we have a responsibility to do more than to simply take care of ourselves. There will be many who will follow in our footsteps. We have kids who are going to follow in our footsteps. Other generations are coming behind us. Generations from now... There's going to be other people sitting in the seats that you're sitting in right now. Well, hopefully we're in another building, but they're sitting in the same listing and part of High Point Church. There's going to be a generation that floods in. When they get there, we must have left them something. Something more than just say, well, try this. No, something that says this really works. If we don't offer this generation the hope of Christ, listen to me church, the world is going to flood in and offer them advice. It are, the world already is. Whether it's on social media, whether it's a pop star, whether it's a movie star, whether it's on television, the world is giving our kids, this next generation, the idea of how they need to live. If we don't give them our values and consistently stand in them ourselves, they're going to pick it up from somebody else. And don't be surprised when they do. It will happen. We must say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Or as for me and our church, we will serve the Lord. That's a statement we can all make. As for me and our church, we're going to come together and we're going to serve the Lord. I need you to understand something this morning that it's not easy to be a young person today. The truth is, it's different than how many of us grew up. It's, I would say right now, it's harder to be a teenager than it's ever been in any time in history. Church, this generation faces more challenges right here. One click away. One click away intellectually, morally, spiritually than most of us have in a lifetime. One click away right here. Our children are under, under, under an unseen assault by Satan. They're under attack. And we need to understand that, that there is an enemy that wants to destroy their lives. That unseen enemy, Satan. Just like the recruiting poster that you used to see on the wall by Uncle Sam that says, I want you. 
That's exactly what Satan is doing for this next generation. He says, I want you. But it's not as pretty as some picture on the wall. You see, Satan, Satan is deceiving. He's behind the scenes working, putting things in our kids' lives to make them fall and make them stumble. He's not out front saying, here I am, I want you. No, he's sneaky. And he's behind the scenes working to try to, get to destroy their lives. Satan wants to destroy our families. Satan wants to destroy this church. Let's just put it where it is. Satan doesn't like the fact we're gathered here this morning, that we have our families here. He doesn't like that. Satan wants to destroy our marriages. And Satan wants to destroy our children's lives. Look what the Bible says about Satan in 1 Peter 5.8. It says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. You see there, it, he, he's sneaky. If you'll know anything about lions, lions don't come out and say, Look at me, here am I. No, they sneak around and they, they, fight, they prowl, that prowl down and they find their, their, what they're wanting to attack and all of a sudden they jump out and they devour. And that's exactly what Scripture says about Satan. Your adversary prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. It says in John 10.10 also, it says Satan's like a thief. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, I like this way better. This is Jesus. I came that they might have life and they may have it abundantly. That's Jesus. That's the way I want to follow. I want that abundant life. I don't want to fall to the trickeries of Satan and let him come in and destroy my marriage and destroy my family and destroy my kids. I don't want that. Satan's objective, church, is to attack our families. He has a deliberate, willful, intentional plan to bring harm to our children, our marriages, and our lives. He can attack us physically, mentally, economically, uh, spiritually, relationally, he is an enemy. He's not somebody to buddy up to. He wants to destroy you this morning. And unless we guard ourselves against the devil and resist him, we could end up being severely wounded. Listen, there's a war for the hearts and minds of our children this morning. And in this war, we're not exactly winning right now. I want to give you some statistics this morning. Listen to this. It's very sobering. Every single day, our children are facing an assault. Every day in the United States of America, 1,000 unwed teenage girls become mothers. Every day. Every day, 1,106 teenage girls have abortions. Every day, 500 teenagers begin using illegal drugs. Every day, 1,000 young people begin drinking alcohol. Every day, 80 teenage girls are raped. Every day, 3,000 kids watch their parents get a divorce. Every day, 15 teenagers say, enough of all this, I give up. And they commit suicide. Every single day in the United States of America, 15 teenagers say, I give up. I'm done. You look around, you're seeing casualties from this war everywhere you look. No, you won't see bloody, bo bloody bodies lying in the streets, but make mo no mistake, the war is real. The battlefield is littered with our children and millions of teenagers are bearing their pain. They're self-medicating by chemical substances. Painkillers are like those 15 that say every day, I can't take this anymore, I'm done. Like a cage fighter stalking his opponent, Satan looks for the right opening and then he leaps on our children. Starts pounding their head and pounding their head in the ground, blow after blow, with every kind of temptation imaginable to them. So what can we do? Do we stand and idly by doing nothing? Well, I hope my kids get it. No, according to the Bible, we've been given a mandate from God to teach and train our children to protect them from the enemy. It's not a promise, but it's a mandate to follow. This morning we're looking at Proverbs chapter 22.6. This is a verse specifically <coughs> written to parents. But I want to widen the scope of this morning as we look at Proverbs 22.6. I want to give you five, quickly, five divine deposits that we need to band together to deposit into the next generation. Proverbs chapter 22.6, let's look at this verse this morning. It says, 
Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Remember that, remember again, Proverbs are not promises, okay? They're mandates that we follow. So a lot of parents have beat themselves up saying, but I trained my child up in the, the Bible and he went astray. And they beat themselves up because of this verse before. Train up a child in the way he should go. We're going to explain exactly what this verse means this morning. And I love the way that Proverbs 22, 6 says in the Message Bible. Bring that up. What does that say? Point. Point your kids in the right direction. And when they're old, they won't be lost. Because you've deposited things in their life that they have something to go back to. Yeah, they may make that choice. We talked about that last week when we were talking about the will of, the will of God versus the will of man. They could make that decision and say, I'm going to go this direction. That's not what we want as parents. But we point them in the right direction. We give them that, that arrow that says, this is really the way you need to go. So number one, the number one deposit that we need to deposit in our kids' lives is deposit, God, deposit godly wisdom into the next generation. We look at that verse again, Proverbs 22, 6, and we see this is the first part we're going to look at here is train up a child. The Hebrew word for train right here is hanak. Hanak. It's used five times in the Old Testament. Four out of the five times it means to dedicate a house or a temple. In this verse, it means to dedicate our children to the Lord. Now there's a picture coming up here. This picture was just several back over the first part of the summer. It was actually on Mother's Day. And this was a child dedication service that took place right here on this stage. We have a special time where we have parents bring their children up on this stage and dedicate them to the Lord. Now I will say, there's nothing about this dedication service that, that is how your kid gets to heaven. Some people have mistaken that. No, this, what this is, is we are create, we're, we're bringing them up in it together with the pastor and the church and the, the mom and dad saying, we're going to create an environment for your kids to learn about God and want to follow God for themselves. It happens in the home, it happens in the church, and we're going to band together with the parents to say, we're going to make sure while they're here, it's going to happen here. But you need to make a commitment that it needs to happen in your home as well. So that's what that is. Pastor Mike will ask the parents, he'll, say, he'll ask them a question, he'll say, are you willing to train your children in the grace, knowledge, and strength of the Lord? And then we as a church say, we're going to help you do that. We're going to be coming behind you and help you with this. That's why this church said this year it's important for us to have a family ministry. This church said we need this. We need this. We need to have a children's ministry. We need to have a youth ministry. We need to have a parents ministry. Where this church will come alongside you as parents with the mutual vision of raising your children up in the Lord so that they will hopefully when they get old be living for God. Karen and I are here now. We're here and we're part of this. We're, we're gonna, I'm now the family pastor. And, and I want to be here to help you as parents. I'm going to tell you up front, I don't have it all figured out. But you know who does? It's right here. And we're going to band together with you as parents. And we're going to come alongside you. And we're going to help nurture you as parents and, and help train your children and help train your teenagers. You know, Karen and I adopted our three kids. And right after we adopted them, we did this service like this at our church. At that, that time, we, we had one that was a newborn, one that was four years old, and one that was 13 years old. And I've told many people that we went from zero to insanity in our lives. <laughs> Isn't that right? <laughs> but as we stood there on that stage, I remember as we were dedicating our children, it was an admission. You know what? We can't do this alone. We can't do this alone. We need help. We need help from God. And we also need the help from our church family. We need that. We can't do this alone. It does take a village to raise a child. And that is what it looks like when you bring your child up and say, I want to dedicate my child to the Lord. That's what that looks like. I'm going to do my best as a mom and dad to raise my child, but I also need the church's help as well. And so that's what the child dedication, and that's really what we're talking about there in that part of training up is dedicating. That verse also means, and actually that Hebrew word has two meanings. It also means to hedge in. Hedge in. It's not just the idea that I'm going to dedicate my child, but I'm also going to create a boundary
for them to grow in. Two different meanings with one Hebrew word. Our responsibility as parents, if you'll imagine the football field, is to go out and paint the lines on the football field, not go move the goalpost. You see, our goal is still the same, but we've got to cre create some boundaries for our children to live life in. And that's what that's about. We're, we're hedging in. We're talking about how we have the responsibility to set some boundaries in our kids' lives. Our kids need boundaries. They don't need to be saying, okay, go out do what you want to do. Dr. Henry Cloud, he writes a very good book for parenting. It's called Boundaries with Kids. And in that, he has, he has some quotes that I want to share with you this morning. The first quote says, Training moments occur when both parents and children do their jobs. The parent's job is to make the rule. The child's job is to break the rule. <laughs> the parent then corrects and disciplines. The child breaks the rule again. How many of you ever had that happen, parents? Yeah, over, yeah, exactly, over and over again, right? And the parent manages the consequences and the empathy that then turns the rule into reality and internal structure for the child. That's where we're talking about our children need structure and boundaries in their life. You say, but Brother Andy, you don't know my kid. You don't know my kid. He throws temper tantrums all the time. Well, he addresses that as well. He said, other children communicate with actions such as tantrums, yelling, name-calling, and running away. The trick is to disallow this form of expression and encourage verbal communication. Basically saying, I want to know what you're feeling, but I want to hear you tell me instead of show me. And that's, how, that, that's, that's a great quote this morning. And he also goes on, he said, children raised with good boundaries learn that they are not only responsible for their lives, but also free to live their lives any way they choose as long as they take responsibility for their choices. For the responsible adult, the sky is the limit. That really goes back to what we were feeding on last week out of Scripture and God's will for our lives. Our responsibility is to train up a child to deposit godly wisdom in their life, to dedicate them to the Lord because they're not yours. By the way, parents, you got your kids on consignment from God for a really a very short amount of time. Really a very short amount of time. I read a quote just this week that said, you have 18 summers with your kids. Think about that one. 18 summers with your kids. Because then they graduate, is that right, brother? And they're off on their own. And they're going about their plan for their life now. Getting married and starting a family and all that. 18 summers with your children. Parents, you have this specific time right now. We as a church have this specific time to come around parents to help them prepare and help these kids prepare for the choices that they will make in life. Number two, we need to deposit inspirational vision into the next generation. Inspirational vision. We have to speak some vision into their lives. The verse goes on, it says, not just train up a child, but it says, in the way he should go. Let's look at this part. In Hebrew, this means in accordance with. In accordance with. It literally means in the mouth of his or her way. It's really the beginning or the starting point. And it really all, defend, the, the, all hinges on the way, this word right here, way. In the way. For many parents, it's the way. It's my way or the highway. The way you wish that you had went, you want to live your life over through your children, uh, or the way that you want them to go. Well, I want my kid to be this occupation. Well, maybe your kid wasn't wired to be that occupation. You see, the second option is a way. A way for the child to go. A way that they're given passion and vision and a gift the way that they're wired. You see, God wired all of our children differently. All three of my kids are different. They're all wired differently. I can't say I want all three of them to be in the same profession. or I want all of them to go the same way. They're not gonna, it's not going to happen. God's designed each of them unique with their different talents. The way that God designed them. That same word way, you can go to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 19. And there's three pictures that's going to be on the screen this morning from that scripture. And it talks about, number one, it says Proverbs 139, 24, the way of an eagle in the sky. That's that same word way. You see this eagle flying in the sky here. It's what that eagle was designed to do. To spread its wings and fly. Listen, parents and church, we are to foster an environment where our kids can spread their wings and fly. Just like that eagle. The Scripture goes on, it actually brings up a snake. Whew, 
Psalms 139, 24, the way of a serpent on a rock. That's what snakes were designed to do. They sit on that rock and uh, as they naturally do. And uh, I was just looking at that. That kind of resembles a teenager on a school morning, right? <laughs> Look at those fangs. Not that I would know anything about that, right? <laughs> yeah, a teenager on a school morning. Look at that. But see, that's what snakes were designed to do. Then the last one that it brought up in Scripture, it says, the way of a ship on the high seas. A boat gets wind in its sails. And it's off to its destination. You see, that's how it should be in our kids' lives. That wind is the vision that we put into the sails of our children. So that they can do what they were designed to do. We put vision in their sails. And as much as we hate to see that day come where we say, Okay, I trust as they walk out the door and they head off to college and they head off to get married and it's what they were designed to do. Proverbs 22.6 in the Amplified says, Train up a child in the way he should go, teaching him to seek God's wisdom and will for his abilities and talents. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Teaching him to seek God's wisdom and will for his abilities and his talents. That's the way that God designed them. Number three, we need to deposit timeless truth. Timeless truth in the next generation. Many today that we live in, the society that we live in, the world that we live in today, would doubt the idea today of absolute truth. Actually, Oscar Wilde wrote, The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Or if you want to look at what Bob Dylan said, Bob Dylan said, all the truth in the world adds up to one big lie. You see, that's what the world's teaching our ch children. This is what the world teaches. And that's really, is it really that depressing? Is there no hope of finding any certainty? Our children are growing up in a very, very uncertain world and their questions are often met with confusing answers. Is there a God? And the world says, probably not. Where did, where did everything come from? The world will turn around and say the Big Bang triggered everything, but before that we can't even be sure. How do I know what's right and wrong? And the world tells our kids there's no absolute morality, so just do what feels good to you. You only got one life to live, so go live it. Our children ask the question, what happens when you die? And the world turns around and says, probably that's just the end. But no one really knows for sure. It seems that truth has become somewhat of a dirty word, or at least a corrupted one in the world that we live in. It's in, in that place, we're left with a whole lot of uncertainty. But listen, the Bible identifies truth not simply as the absence of lies, but as a quality intrinsic to the very nature of Almighty God, as was fully manifested in His precious Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus not only spoke true words, he was and is and always will be the ultimate expression of truth. Jesus is truth. If we take the timeless truth of God's Word and we deposit it into our kids' lives, listen, it's first got to happen here. We've got to deposit it into our lives first before we can even deposit it in our kids' lives. Proverbs 22.6 goes on to say, it says, train up a child in the way he should go and even when he is old. You see, we need to deposit this truth so that it doesn't last for just tomorrow but it lasts for the rest of their life. What we see here is what we deposit in their life needs to last a lifetime. So we look at this. What timeless truth do we need to deposit in this next generation? What would, it, what would we think the Bible might say is the, most, the very most important thing that we need to deposit? And I think the Bible is very clear with a four-letter word called love. John 13, 34, and 35 says, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Jesus said that is how we will know that you're His. According to how we love one another. That is our proof of how someone is truly, truly a follower of Christ. Church, how about you this morning? The most important lesson I can teach and pass on to my three children is to love and follow Jesus. We have to show them love or we have to teach them love by showing them love. And we show them love by loving the next generation. That's the next slide coming up here. 
love the next generation enough, ouch, to admit that you're wrong. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whosoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Listen, we need to admit that we're sinners. And so are they. An ongoing conversation in our house needs to sound like this. Does mommy sin? Absolutely. Does daddy sin? Absolutely. Does Nevaeh sin? Yes. Does Serenity sin? Yes. Does Malachi sin? Yes. We all do wrong things. That's why we're so thankful for Jesus. We need Jesus. He, he forgives us and takes the, as Malachi would say, takes the yuckies out of our hearts. Y'all like that word yucky? Takes the yuckies out of our heart and helps us to change. We teach them that we're sinners and so are they. It's obvious that we're not perfect, that we all need Jesus. Church, every one of us sitting in here this morning needs Jesus. Every one of us. Deuteronomy 6 5 says, You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. The next way we show love is love the generation enough to connect, not just correct. <coughs> For, sorry about that. 1 Thessalonians 2 8 says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Parenting is not just about correcting. We've got to connect with our kids. We have to connect with our kids as a church. We have to connect with these kids that fill up these rooms back here. Not just say, well, whoever's teaching this morning, you got it. You got it, Ed. Go have fun. No, we have to, as a church, connect with this generation out here. Not just scream and holler, you're doing wrong. We need to connect with them enough and show them love to say that we care and this is the right way. Love the next generation enough to be refined by adversity, not defined by it. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking, lacking in nothing. Church, we need to be refined by the adversity, and we're going to face adversity, by the way. We need to be refined by the adversity so that we can teach, that we can train, and we can mentor the next generation coming up. Kids don't need somebody that's fake in their lives. They need real today. They need someone that's real that can look them in the face, can look them dead in their, eye, dead in their eyes and say, you know what? I have been there. I know what you're facing. Not just some facade. They say, I know what you're going through. I'm here to help. I love you enough to care. So the trial that you're in is a test to your faith. The pain you're going through, the difficulty, maybe you're in a bad relationship. God wants to use that to produce, it says to produce steadfastness so that it can have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. We need to love the next generation enough to, to replace attitudes of entitlement and privilege with servant and thanksgiving. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. We are in a generation of this. Gimme, 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 gimme. That's what our world is right now. Gimme, gimme. It's an entitled generation. We need to replace that attitude with the privilege of servanthood. Look at the Bible. Look, at, look straight at our example of Jesus Christ. He was the greatest servant that ever walked the face of this earth. Jesus modeled servanthood and thanksgiving. And that's what He's saying. We need to replace that attitude of gimme, gimme, gimme with the idea that we need to serve others and we need to be thankful for what we have. The, the, love the generation enough next to know what hills to die on. Have you ever heard that statement, to know what hills to die on? You know what that means? That means we need to choose our battles. We need to choose our battles. John 3.17 said, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that in order that the world might be saved through Him. That's enough said there. We, need to know, we just need to choose the battles that we fight with our kids. We need to love them enough to show them Jesus. Finally, love the generation enough to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. 
I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We need to be models in grace and truth in what we do. We need to walk here as Ephesians 4 said. That's our bullseye. That's our bullseye. We're to walk according to how we've been called, all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We're to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. So we need to love this generation enough to admit that admit when we're wrong, connect, not just correct, be refined by adversity, not just be refined by it, knows what hills to die on, walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Number four, we need to deposit radical reliance into the next generation. I'm going to make this quick. It says, train up a child in the way he should go and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is dependency. It says that we'll not depart from it. What is it? It's the way, the truth that you have given them. Scripture has told us how to do this in John 15, 5. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he that bears much fruit, for apart from it, you can do nothing. Jesus describes here the essence of a fruitful Christian life. By faith, we must be connected to Christ. In every second, every day of our life, the most God-honoring and abundant life of peace and fruitfulness in Christ. Parents, this means your home needs to be plugged into Jesus. This means you as a mama and daddy need to be plugged into Jesus. This means we as a church have to be plugged into Jesus. This generation needs to see us depending on God to provide. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. We have to teach this to our kids. It's what we were talking about last week, again, in God's will for our lives. And finally, number five, we have to deposit everlasting hope. Everlasting hope into the next generation. Proverbs 22, verses 17 through 19 says, Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise, and apply your hearts to my knowledge, for it will be pleasant if you keep them within you. If all of them are ready on your lips, that your trust may be in the Lord. You see, we skipped ahead from Proverbs 22, 6 to another verse here. You see, I don't know how to develop hope apart from trusting God for who He is and what He said. We develop hope for ourselves and hope for our families and hope for High Point Church by trusting in God. That's what this church was founded on. Trusting in God. Trusting in God for the future. My mom and dad taught me this. And I'm thankful they taught me this. They gave me hope in what I could do and what I could become. They have been so supportive of every single decision I've ever made in my life. And they still are today. They taught me there was nothing I could do to earn favor with God. They gave me hope in what I could do and what I could become. And they gave me hope that we could be used by God here in Cincinnati. And I'm thankful my mom and dad are so supportive and they taught me this as a child. They taught me there was nothing I could do outside of God. I had to have God and depend upon God. I'm going to ask you to do something this morning as we look, we look back at the five divine deposits we make in the next generation. Number one, godly wisdom. Number two, inspiring vision. Number three, timeless truth. Number four, radical reliance. And number five, everlasting hope. If you would, go ahead and get the kids and bring them on into the service this morning. I'm going to ask everybody to stand together this morning. And we're going to put something on the screen here. And these are five divine deposits to make into the next generation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to read the first one and the second one. Then I'm going to have you ask you as you stand to repeat each one of these after me this morning. We're just going to say, we're going to, as a church, be willing this morning to say, I want to help make deposits in the next generation. The first one says, I will invest godly wisdom. Let's say that together. I will invest godly wisdom. Second, I will invest inspiring vision. Inspiring vision. I will invest timeless truth. I will invest timeless truth. I will invest radical reliance. I will invest radical reliance. And finally, I will invest everlasting hope. I will invest everlasting hope. If you'd bring the kids on down right here in the center this morning, all the kids come down, right down here. And then I'm going to ask parents, I want you to surround your kids right here in the altar, right here in the front. Kids, come on down. Teenagers, come on down. 
If you want to be a kid, come on down. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you to come right here. Right here in the middle. And then parents, I want you to surround. Now church, I want you to surround these parents. Everybody. Everybody come down this morning. I want you to surround all these parents. I'm going to pray over these kids, my kids. I'm going to pray over all these kids and these parents and the church as a whole. We're committing as a church for this next generation. It's just a picture we can do this morning. These kids are the next generation. Look at them. These kids. The next generation that's going to step out and serve the Lord. I was so thankful to see my daughter stand up here this morning and sing on stage. You see that next generation that takes the baton and says, I'm ready to run. I'm ready to run for the Lord. That's what we have to inspire in these kids. And those, those truths right there. So let's pray and then we're going to have the, the worship team's going to come back up on stage and sing that last song that we sang that's so perfect for this morning. But let's pray this morning. God, we come to you this morning thanking you so much for this time you've given us. Father, I think of all the kids in our church, many that aren't even here this morning, some are on vacation. And... But God, just in a few weeks, this room behind me and this nursery, we're even talking about having to have one other room, Lord, are going to be flowing over with children. God, help us as a church to come around these parents. To invest in this next generation, God. God, they, this generation needs You. They need to see You. Help us to be visions in their life, Father God, to implant that vision. To help implant the truth of the Gospel. Father, I pray for these parents, Lord. God, I know how crazy it gets. Every day. I pray for these parents, Lord, that You'll help them, strengthen them, encourage them, guide them, Father. Give them strength on those days that they want to pull their hair out, Lord. Encourage them in a way that only You can. And help give them the strength to teach their children in their home about You. To model You. Help these parents to be plugged into You, Father. And help us as a church now to surround them. To raise their children. To raise this next generation. To reach beyond the doors of our church and reach the generation that's out here in Mason. Father, help us with that, Father. We love You. We thank You. We commit these kids to You this morning, Lord. God, I can't wait to see in the future what happens with these kids, Lord, as they step out and want to serve You, Father. God, thank You for this time together this morning. Thank You for Your living Word. Thank You for strength. Thank You for encouragement. Father, thank You for the time we've gathered here in this church this morning. We pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Worship team, sing to us this morning as we close out. And I'll say, walk in His strength.